The maps call it the Gulf of California. It's enclosed between the barren peninsula of Baja California and the Mexican mainland. The first Spanish explorers made this map when Hernando Cortes discovered the Gulf in 1539. The dried up rocky barren shores have a weird quality. It's the land of the Bujum tree, whose branches grow downside up in defiance of the usual laws of nature. Baja means lower. Baja California has few roads or amenities to attract American tourists from over the border at Tijuana to the north. Just cacti and rocks and mountains, and heat that bounces off like a physical blow. The peninsula is fascinating enough, but it was the 800 mile long Sea of Cortez and its superabundant life which we came to explore. A commotion of gulls often means fish moving below the surface. Cameraman Des Bartlett went down to investigate and met with more than he'd bargained for. Those gill slits look as though they could easily engulf a man. From above, we could see the dappled pattern of spots and knew we'd encountered one of the most impressive inhabitants of the Cortez, the largest fish that swims in the oceans, a 30-foot whale shark. We dropped two more divers, scientist Dave Harris and camera assistant Lee Lyon. A whale shark is used to sucker fishes riding on its sandpaper hide, so it probably doesn't even feel Dave Harris clinging to its dorsal fin. Lee is in no danger from the monster. The whale shark is completely harmless to man and even to other fishes. To discover why the Sea of Cortez is so rich in life, you have only to watch the whale shark's huge mouth in action as it gobbles down a galaxy of minute creatures twinkling like the Milky Way against a rock. They're plankton. Plankton, directly or indirectly, feeds everything in the Cortez. Sardines thrive on the plankton. Shoals of bigger fish chase the sardines and so on up the food chain. The chain of life which starts with plankton continues above the surface. The water boils as gulls snatch fish who had ventured too near to the world of light and air. The Cortez is like a narrow trough into which the earth is continually pouring fertilizer. 
Flash floods wash minerals out of the mountains along its shores. To the north lies the delta of the Colorado River, America's richest artery. For millions of years, it has been spilling out the lifeblood of the Rockies, of the Grand Canyon of the Southwest Deserts. Enriched by all these minerals, the Cortez at times blooms red with plankton, and all life blossoms and blooms on it. Like a bomber carrying a torpedo, an osprey flies in with a fish slung beneath it. It's at the climax of the food chain that starts in the swarms of plankton. The mullet caught in these talons was a product of that fertile sea. The great fish hawk has torn off the head to feed itself, but it has brought back the body for its young family. we get excited if two pairs of ospreys manage to raise young in the Scottish Highlands. Along the shores of the Cortez, osprey nests are on every rocky headland, sometimes perched in the arms of giant cacti. They're there because the fish are there. The fish are there all right. Lee Lyon plays a 120 pound striped marlin. Someday soon, the Cortez is going to be discovered as a big game angler's paradise. But this battle is only partly for sport. On the pole is a barbed nylon tag. The US and Mexican fisheries departments are carrying out an extensive tagging operation to find how these big game fish move around the oceans. The wire trace will be cut and the great fish freed to carry a tag that will tell the story of its travels to anyone else who catches it. The San Augustine, the second ship in our expedition, makes rendezvous with us off the rocky coast of Baja. Her skipper is naturalist Antero Diaz. Aboard are scientists from the Desert Museum of Arizona, who've come to study the wildlife of the Cortez with us. Our crisscraft, Osprey, can do 25 knots and soon overhauls them. We're on our way to examine the marine life off San Lorenzo Island. We quickly attract an escort of several species of marine mammals. These sleek black torpedoes are the dolphins called pilot whales. Ahead now, we spot something more menacing. White markings and tall dorsal fins say they're killer whales. The San Augustine lies at anchor off uninhabited San Lorenzo Island. Suddenly, something that looks like a nuclear sub surfaces right alongside.
It's the second largest animal the world has ever known. Only the 100-ton blue whale surpasses the 75-foot-long finback whale in size. Valves open its giant blowhole, closing it again before the water rushes in. Desert Museum scientists from the San Augustine wanted to see what a finback looked like from down below. Despite its size, it would be unlikely to attack them. It's another plankton feeder. But the whale had moved on, so they had to be content with a green turtle who obligingly gave them a tow. As usual, the water all around was thick with plankton. Was this what the whale had been feeding on? Lee volunteered to go down with a net to catch samples for the Desert Museum biologists. It seems ridiculous that a 75-foot-long whale can keep body and fin together with creatures as small as these. Yet food like this is almost certainly what the whale was sieving from the sea as it slowly cruised along. Lee's next dive reveals another treasure, a seabed mint of sand dollars. They're relatives of the starfish and the sea urchin. They don't move around much. They live by eating, guess what? More plankton. Plankton is a mysterious word to many people. It comes from a Greek word meaning wandering. And it really means all the minute life forms that wander about at the mercy of the currents. Desert Museum scientist Merv Larson finds a sea hare. It's a mollusk, halfway between a sea slug and a snail. Its defense is to release a cloud of purple dye. Unlike the sepia from an octopus, this dye is quite easily washed off the skin. Another secretive seabed character, a spanner or shame-faced crab. His defense is to close up so tightly that it takes a spanner, or so the story goes, to open his pincers. In this case, a spanner isn't necessary. Perhaps a meeting with a mermaid is too much for him. Cruising along the shores of San Lorenzo Island, our boat gets a new kind of escort, sea lions. The sea lions seem to have learned a trick or two from the dolphins. When they play like this, it's called 
porpoising. Even underwater, sea lions like to play games. This one's carrying a pelican feather. Scientists used to think the sea lions just visited the Cortez from the open Pacific and didn't breed here. But here's a young pup to prove they certainly do. It wasn't until the biologists from the Desert Museum started exploring the Cortez quite recently that they discovered that there were large breeding colonies on some of its islands. This pup can only have been born here. The nearest colonies in the Pacific are 800 miles away. He's so small that his mother has to tow him around by the ear for swimming lessons. The boss in any sea lion colony is the master bull. He's an extremely rugged character who aims to surround himself with as many wives as possible. The boss bull has to face some fierce competition and none of his ladies is above sneaking off with an attractive rival. So he patrols all day to warn the girls to keep in line. All round it's pretty exhausting work. His love life makes him extremely bad-tempered. He can't stand intruders, not even a harmless western gull. The gull has her family problems too, a pair of youngsters to feed and shelter. The western gulls are utterly ruthless. They'll even steal and eat one another's chicks. One of the parents has to stay close all the time in case hungry neighbors drop in for a cannibal snack. Here's a gull family whose children have passed the most dangerous age. The baby pelican their parent has just given them wasn't nearly so lucky. A pelican looks on unmoved as tragedy overtakes one of its kind. A small boat leaves the San Augustine for San Lorenzo Island. Aboard is a landing party of scientists from the Desert Museum of Arizona. Their objective, the island's pelican colony. The adult birds don't wait to find out what it's all about. They head out to sea. It's the youngsters who can barely fly that the biologists are after. Brown pelicans live by catching surface fish, the ones most likely to be affected by DDT and other chemical pollution. Great numbers of pelicans are already dying in the USA, around the coasts of Florida. No, biologist James Keith is not pumping up a cactus. He's preparing the spraying apparatus with which to mark the young pelicans after they've been fitted with leg rings and plastic markers. The harmless yellow dye will stay on for nearly a year and will make it easy for scientists to follow the bird's movements. This will provide important clues as to where pelicans are picking up polluted food and which nesting areas are safe to them.
Directly the scientists leave, the western gulls, who never miss an opportunity to rob an unguarded nest, move in in force. It's difficult not to look upon the western gulls as robbers and murderers, but of course they've got their own hungry families to feed. Despite the predatory gulls, the brown pelicans still manage to rear enough chicks. This is one of the few places in the world where rival species can be left to solve their own problems. In almost any other bird sanctuary, man would have to control the gulls to give the other nesting birds a chance. But the Cortez is so rich in food that there's plenty for all to breed successfully. Gulls put pressure on pelicans. Pelicans put pressure on fish. Once again, the food chain leads back to the richness of the sea. But before they go fishing, the pelicans thoroughly overhaul flying equipment after long, hot hours spent guarding the nest. The fish shoals have moved close in shore, so the pelicans get airborne in mass formations. However, unlike the larger white pelican, the brown species is a solitary fisherman. When he's fishing, he has a new kind of relationship with another species of gull called a Hearman's gull. The gull comes in the moment the pelican completes his clumsy dive. It's difficult to see what the gull gets out of the relationship since the pelican swallows his fish whole. But the gull always sticks close by, even when the fish has disappeared down the pelican's throat. Even the scientists in our party were mystified by the meaning of the partnership. Perhaps the gulls are after very small fish tipped out of the pelican's bills, but it's hard to be certain. It's just one more mystery of the Sea of Cortez, but far greater mysteries still lay ahead of our expedition. We weigh anchor for the island of Raza. Raza is little more than a flat rock. It lies not far offshore, just over 250 miles down the Gulf of California. When we get to Raza, we shall be hard at work filming for several weeks. So, one of our girl photographers relaxes a little on the voyage south.
Our skipper, Antero Diaz, and his brother are both keen naturalists. They've made many voyages to Raza. What we're about to see on the island, they assure us, is one of the greatest wildlife spectacles on Earth. Only the richest sea on Earth could provide it. Our first glimpse of Raza is something of an anticlimax. At the center of the island, there's a large Hearman's gull colony. But surely this doesn't amount to the great wildlife spectacle Diaz promised us. A good many of the gulls are already nesting and scarcely bother to move when we approach. Lee even picks up a chick. She puts it carefully back in the same nest. But the chick seems uneasy. Is this really its home? It moves to another nesting scrape next door, which in the murderous world of a gull colony is taking a considerable risk. But this time he gets away with it. His mother finds him and immediately gives him shelter. What's so exciting about a gull colony, even one this size? Diaz says, the Hearman's gulls are only the start of the story. They arrive first to set up their nesting colony and rear their young. The gulls' arch enemies aren't due on Raza for a few days yet. Meantime, the vast gull colony settles down in comparative peace, like an army pitching its tents before a battle. The only event to shatter the calm is the daily visit of the two Mexican wardens who protect the birds of Raza from commercial egg sellers who used to raid the island from the mainland. Today, the Mexican government has made Raza a sanctuary. One of the wardens' main tasks is to catch gulls for ringing. They use a primitive but highly effective method. A nylon loop placed round an empty nesting scrape is pulled tight when the bird returns. It's rough and ready, but perhaps no harder on the bird than getting tangled up in the mist nets that most ornithologists use to catch birds for ringing. has already produced some interesting facts about the travels of Hearman's gulls. They only come to Raza to nest. The rest of the year, they range as far north as British Columbia. For several days, more and more Hearman's gulls had arrived, until they seemed to have taken up every foot of available nesting space. The minute sand flies troubled us. They found their way into everything, even cameras. But they didn't seem to bother the nesting and mating gulls. On the stony surface of Raza, anything was of value for lining the gulls' spartan nests. It was by no means all a peaceful domestic scene. 
Gulls are fiercely territorial round their nests. Feuds broke out all the time. Now something happened to change the whole scene. That something was, as always, due to the very richness of the Cortez. Vast silver shoals of sardines had moved right inshore. And with the sardines, in fact to feed on them, had come the advanced scouts of the Gull's historic enemies, the Turns of Raza. The great set-piece battle that has been fought out on Raza for centuries was once again about to be joined. The first turns to arrive content themselves with picking off a few of the sardines. At first, there is no conflict with the humans' gulls. Gulls and terns share the rocks and the shoreline. There's more than enough fish for both. It looks like a perfect plan for peaceful coexistence. But it doesn't last long. Soon, the terns start to leave the shoreline and fly towards the center of the island. They parachute down in ever-increasing numbers, right in the middle of the established gull colony. There are two species, royal terns and elegant terns. The royals are the ones with the raised crest. By sheer weight of numbers, the terns take over the entire center of the gull's colony. From the start, the gulls, aggressive as they are, haven't a chance. It's like being buried in a blizzard of white birds, a blizzard that falls and falls. By now, the Terns were so well in command of the battlefield that they didn't mind us walking about to set up remote control cameras and hides. The panicky ones were the gulls who'd been forced to the outer fringe of the nesting area. Occasionally, they'd panic some of the Terns, but never the main colony. We estimated now there were close on half a million birds on two acres of Raza. It really was one of the wildlife wonders of the world. Now, phase two of the battle was ready to begin. During the last few weeks, the terns had laid and hatched their eggs. They were starting to fly in fish to feed their young. Often a tern found the air so crowded that he had to make another circuit before he could land at his own nest. The gulls had lost the battle for nesting space. 
So now they tried intercepting the fish carriers. This turn got through with his catch. If a gull succeeded in robbing a turn, he'd often find his comrades waiting to rob him. They've all got hungry youngsters to feed. Neither side can afford to let up for a moment, though the gulls waste a lot of precious energy in purely civil war. The winner swallows the prize to soften it up for her family. Typically gull-like, they just can't wait for dinner to be served. The terns who penetrate the gull fighter screen feed their young with fish nearly as big as the chicks themselves. Though they've been driven away from the centre of the nesting area, quite a few of the gulls rear young successfully around the fringes of the colony. A local success for the gulls. Two chicks quarrel over a dead young tern. Any turn chick who has temporarily mislaid his parents is in deadly danger. There doesn't seem to be a friendly face, even among his own kind. The chick can only call in the hope that his parents are somewhere overhead. She finds him just in time. The marvellous thing is that amongst all these thousands of chicks, the mothers can recognise their own young. Victory in taking over the nesting area has its price. For those terns crowded out to the edge of the colony, because that's where the choya cactus grows. This full-grown tern has flown into the choya and been held fast by its spines. It isn't only the adult terns who are in danger. There are always a good many choya fragments lying about beneath the cactus. Once the chicks touch these, they're hooked on the barbs. Though these are natural disasters that happen in thousands every nesting season, we just had to help whenever we could. This chick seemed almost dead until Lee Lyon and Jen Bartlett gave it first aid. Once the spines were out, the chick recovered almost at once. A few young gulls get caught in the choya trap too. Dave Harris, one of our biologists, comes to the rescue this time. A choya is completely impartial as to whom it attacks. Lee used a couple of stones as forceps to pull the barbs out and then gave the gull similar emergency treatment. Even when all the cactus had been removed and the gull was ready to go free, there was still one operation to be completed.
The thing about the Choya cactus is that it never gives up. Despite some casualties, the Terns had raised armies of chicks. And like an army on the march, thousands of these young Terns are now ready to go down to the seashore. Phase three of the great bird battle is beginning. The gulls' skirmishers are posted. The turn youngsters can't fly yet, and the gulls mean to harry them every yard of the way. It's unlikely at this stage that the gulls will actually kill them. But the tern's forced march is taking them too close to the gulls' nesting territory, and the response is automatically one of fierce aggression. Pure instinct drives them on towards the seashore. They know they have to reach it. The next stage in their lives has been achieved. They have got to start feeding themselves. A last dash and they've made it. They've successfully run the gauntlet. So you could say that this is yet another victory for the Terns. But it's always the last battle that counts. Wars are decided by who wins the final round. And strangely enough, it's the Tern's very success in rearing all these thousands of chicks that sows the seed of their colony's destruction. It opens the way for the Heerman's Gull's last offensive. Once all those chicks have gone, the Tern's empire begins to fall apart. There are great gaps in it. The waiting gulls close in. An elegant tern tucks her egg away as a raiding gull stalks by. Some royal terns make a gallant last stand. The gulls are everywhere, like a fifth column right in the center of the tern colony. The more panic they can cause, the more eggs will be left unguarded. The Battle of Raza has been fought every year just like this for centuries. But in nature's sight, no one is the loser. The gulls are left in possession of the battlefield. But both gulls and terns have ensured the survival of their species. Antero Diaz, skipper of the San Agustin, was right after all. We had just watched and filmed one of the greatest wildlife spectacles on Earth. But then, 
Everything that happens to you is larger than life when you explore the richest sea in the world. <laughs>